Following morning prayers, our men surrounded the village, brushing past its 20 hopelessly outnumbered defenders. They surrounded the village from three directions, leaving open the eastern flank, with the aim of driving out some 6,000 people in an hour. When this failed to happen, the armed men jumped out of their vehicles and started shooting at people indiscriminately. Venturing back into the village the next day, one witness saw piles of dead bodies with many strewn about, including of children and his own father. This wasn't a description of the Hamas terrorist attack, but the massacre at Dawamye between Beersheba and Hebron. Eyewitnesses, some of them Israeli soldiers, described horrific scenes. Babies whose skulls were cracked open, women raped or burned alive, men stabbed to death. These were not reports delivered years later, but eyewitness accounts. Hi, I'm Praveen Swami. Thank you for joining The Print Explorer. For those of you who've been watching this series, a special thank you. And for those of you who are new, I hope you enjoy this. I'm going to be talking today about Israel. As you know, in the news right now is the grinding war and specifically Israel's plans to launch attacks on Rafah in Gaza, where hundreds of thousands of refugees from the rest of the Gaza Strip have gathered. Israel says this operation is necessary to crack open the last centers of Hamas uh, armed resistance. As you know, Hamas had conducted a hideous terrorist attack last year, uh, killing more than a thousand Israelis and uh, conducting a large-scale sexual violence against some people. News on that just coming out. Um, since then, Israel's hit back um, and while it's killed many Hamas Kada, Unfortunately, 29,000 civilians, um, including thousands of children, are believed to have been killed in airstrikes and ground assaults. Uh, this is the big one of the big stories of our times, just because of its sheer scale and intensity and moral complexity. But I had a lot of people ringing in to ask how all this actually began. How did this story start? How did Israelis and Palestinians end up in this state of long-running conflict with each other that hasn't been solved by three wars? What exactly is going on? And I'm going to try and talk you through that origin story of the conflict, uh, the creation of the State of Israel in 1947 and the war uh, that, that followed it, and how people ended up where they are. And I think for Indians, for three reasons, this story is particularly interesting. Uh, the first, of course, is partition. Israel and Palestine, the conflict uh, began because of a partition that took place at the moment of Israel's birth. Um, and that's very, very familiar to Indians. And it, this is about what happens, uh, I guess, to many places that are partitioned on ethnic or religious lines. Uh, the second part of the story uh, that is very relevant to us as Indians is, of course, as we'll see, imperialism, empires, uh, played a great role in the shaping and making of this conflict, and that should be familiar to us too. Uh, and the third and most important thing or fascinating thing to me is that much of the story I'm going to tell you uh, came out of a big rewriting and introspection uh, that came from Israeli historians about their own national origins in the 1980s. So until then, Israeli history had, with some exceptions and important exceptions, been largely sort of stuck to the nationalist, authorized telling of the country's origin. And the 80s, a bunch of new historians, as they were called, who came from outside the professional historical establishment or uh, uh, history departments of universities, uh, began digging into the country's history, talking to eyewitnesses, and they came up with what must have been a very painful uh, self-examination. Um, and to me, that's fascinating because in this country, we've had periodically debates about the telling and retelling of history. Um, and in this case, uh, you actually had historians uh, dismantling many of the most cherished myths uh, about their founding, uh, founding nationhood. So I'll come back to some of uh, these lessons at the very end. First on with the story itself. From the outset, uh, Palestine was run by what was called a British mandate. Uh, it, was, it was a colony. The British acquired a mandate to run this territory. 
Um, and uh, they allowed the Zionist movement, which was starting um, in Europe in the early 20th century, uh, to, began, to begin acquiring uh, some territories in uh, Palestine. Jews, of course, in Europe had suffered terribly uh, as a result of large-scale pogroms and violence and discrimination, uh, which long predated the Second World War. Um, and many of them were keen to establish a Jewish national homeland, which was what the Zionist movement was about. Um, Zionists had also begun to prepare, interestingly, for the possibility of taking over this land eventually by armed force. And this, I guess, became a question in many of their minds because, you see, the British had promised this same land both to their Arab allies and to the Zionists. So both of them being given promises or what they understood to be promises uh, to be allowed to found a, a, a modern nation state uh, in, in Israel. And one of the guys, fascinating character, uh, the messiah from England, if you like, uh, Odd Charles Wingate, uh, who made Zionist leaders understand very fully that statehood also had to have military, uh, an army, all of it to protect Jewish enclaves, but also to take territory. Uh, Wingate was born in India, uh, another of those interesting connections in the early 20th century to a military family that was serving here and received this, uh, what some would call a fanatically religious upbringing. Um, he began a career in the Sudan where he gained prestige by, uh, by doing very well in actions against uh, slave traders. And in 1936, he was assigned to serve in Palestine where he became very uh, entwined with the Zionist dream. Now, Wingate was not a Jew, he was a Christian, but there's been a tradition uh, which we now see particularly in America of Christian fundamentalists uh, finding inspiration or religious uh, uh, sort of inspiration in uh, the Zionist movement. And uh, Wingate then began teaching various uh, Zionist uh, militia uh, the methods and tactics they needed to fight wars. He transformed the principal uh, military organization of the Jewish communities in Israel, the Haganah, uh, which means defense in Hebrew and was founded in 1920. He trained them to be a modern paramilitary force. Uh, there was an Arab revolt uh, uh, in 1929 and it gave the Haganah a chance to practice uh, you know, uh, some of their tactics in Palestinian dominated rural areas. Uh, he taught them to take, uh, uh, you know, how to use snipers, uh, how to combat gangs of thieves. Um, and these forces also began intimidating Palestinians uh, to sort of knock them out of Jewish areas or to give up their claims. Uh, for example, in June 1938, now this is long before the creation of Israel, Jewish troops got their first taste of what it meant to occupy a, a Palestinian village. A Haganah unit and a British company, a British military company, jointly attacked a village on the Israel-Lebanon uh, border territories and held it for several hours. Fighting the British. As the Second World War drew close, the Jewish leadership in Palestine embarked on a campaign to push the British out of the territory. Now, they continued to map out plans uh, for the Palestinian population, which was then 75% uh, of the population, if not more. Uh, many poorer Palestinians had sold land to Jews but continued to stay on as tenants on lands that their uh, former landlords had sold. Uh, and many uh, of them uh, sort of naturally were very, very angry at these uh, settlers who began arriving in growing numbers uh, on what they considered to be their historical lands. Uh, Leading Zionists you know, did not air their views on what needed to be done with this Palestinian majority in the new Jewish state in private. Uh, but one of, uh, one of them, Joseph Weitz, wrote in 1940, it is our right to transfer the Arabs. The Arabs should go. Uh, David Ben-Gurion, who uh, was one of the founding fathers uh, of Israel and a very important uh, figure in the history of the country, wrote to his son in 1937, uh, apparently convinced that, and I quote, the Arabs have to go, uh, but one needs an opportune moment for making it happen, uh, like a war. This was the man, of course, who would become the country's first prime minister. Ben Gurion knew that maximalist schemes, uh, you know, which clamored for the whole of mandatory Palestine, 
that is British Palestine to be uh, the state of Israel uh, were not realistic. Um, while the Second World War had gone on in particular, it was of course impossible to pressure Britain uh, through direct confrontation because Britain was of course for a long time the only force fighting, uh, only significant national force uh, fighting Nazi Germany. And uh, in post-war, but the post-war government that came in Britain um, after the Second World War, that of Clement Attlee, had you know, very different ideas about Palestine. Now, the Labour Party which took office after the Second World War was dying to be rid of its colonial commitments. It understood that the world had changed, that America and the Soviet Union after the Second World War were the two preeminent powers. And uh, Clement Attlee, who became Prime Minister of Britain after uh, Winston Churchill, uh, believed that the time had come to stop wasting money on colonies, of course, India, uh, uh, many uh, in the Middle East, but also uh, Palestine, and to spend that money instead on building a welfare state in Britain. And that led to a precipitate rush to get out of these colonies. Um, there were armed attacks. Uh, by Jewish underground uh, groups. Uh, bridges were bombed, military bases, and famously the British, the headquarters of the British uh, army, uh, the King David Hotel. Very big bombing with terrible casualties. Um, uh, but uh, in comparison to, you know, the brutal treatment Britain had given to uh, uh, Arab rebels from 29 onwards and through the 30s, um, Britain wasn't wasn't looking to uh, you know uh, dominate this territory any longer and didn't see much point. There was some disarmament of Jewish troops, a large number of which they had themselves armed and recruited. Uh, there were arrests of of course some Zionist leaders, um, but uh, you know Britain had a hundred thousand troops in Palestine. It didn't want to pay the bill. It wanted out. And the final days of 1946, August 1946, uh, Ben-Gurion gathered together the leadership of the Zionist movement uh, in a hotel in Paris, uh, 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 the Royal Montsouet, I believe it's pronounced, um, and uh, helped him and, and tried to forge or get build a consensus on partitioning Palestine. Uh, Nachman Goldman, one of the important Zionist leaders, ple pleaded with the British government in London while his colleagues in uh, Paris deliberated their next move. Um, they agreed to what was called a part of Palestine. Some people called it a small part, some people called it the larger part. Um, but they wanted, agreed to an area in which they would have Jewish predominance. And the idea was that Israel had to be a homeland for the Jews. Uh, obviously, it could not be uh, a, a place where uh, there was a large or a Arab population, much larger than the Jews themselves. Um, there needed to be, in the minds of the Zionist leaders, a, a Jewish state. And um, they, Ben Gurion hit on this plan to back a partition. But now the question was, how much of a partition? And this is where the games of empires or nations come in. See, two years old in 1947, the whole matter ended up, the, the future of Palestine, in the hands of the United Nations. And the UN, not only was it just two years old, it didn't have a lot of experience in dealing with conflicts. Uh, they appointed a special committee on Palestine, UN SCOP, uh, to sort of settle the issue. UN SCOP thought partition was the way to go. Um, there was some talk of, you know, making Palestine maybe one democratic state um, whose future would be decided eventually by a majority vote, but they abandoned the idea. So instead, UNSCOP recommended to the UN that part Palestine be partitioned into two states, uh, but it envisaged that there would be some kind of federation like economic unity and it wanted the city of Jerusalem to be an international city, a separate sort of entity under a UN administered international regime because Jerusalem of course uh, a city of great importance to all the Abrahamic faiths um, and uh, the UN thought that everyone should have some stake on it and it would also stop uh, disputes between the Arabs and the Jews over who should control this city. But the UN totally ignored the ethnic composition of the treaties that were being administered. Now, obviously, if you're going to have two states, one with an Arab majority and one with a Jewish majority, 
you needed to figure out who would go where and exactly how it was uh, done. Now, at that point, if the Jews, if if the land had been uh, partitioned on a strictly population basis, uh, the Jewish state would have made up maybe 10% of the land. Uh, but the United States accepted the nationalist claims of the Zionist movement uh, and it wanted to compensate the Jews or give them a homeland uh, in Europe, uh, or outside Europe, excuse me, a homeland outside Europe. Uh, now, why outside Europe, you might ask? And for that, I'll come back to some of these questions at the end. But you need to understand that uh, European Jews were genuinely wondering after the Second World War if they had any future left. It wasn't only in Germany that Jews had been subjected to genocide. Uh, it had happened across swathes of uh, 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 Eastern Europe. Um, even in France, there had been large numbers of people who collaborated uh, uh, with uh, the genocide of the Jews, with the Nazi genocide. Uh, it, even in Britain, before the Second World War in the United States, they had been less than welcoming of Jewish immigration, despite knowing uh, how terribly Jews were being treated in Nazi Germany. The gates on immigration had shut down. And it's understandable that European Jews were terrified uh, about the, their future. They wanted a homeland that they could call their own. And this one in Palestine had been promised. Uh, and, you know, Palestinians will tell you that this was uh, racism at work, imperial racism. Who was Britain to give away the land of the Arabs? That's what many Indian nationalist leaders uh, thought as well. Um, but... I think in history, it's important to understand that everything has two sides and we have to understand the fears that were driving uh, Jewish immigration to Israel. The Arab League, the inter-Arab organization sort of walked out of these UNSCOP uh, resolutions on how best the UN uh, 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 resolutions should be implemented on ground um, in November 1947. And that meant that the Zionists pretty much had a clean run on shaping uh, the, discu the discussion. And that meant the Zionist movement eventually was given by the UN, a state that stretched to over half the country. Um, now, part of this as, as well was uh, the Palestinian position had always been that they, since 1918, had been opposed to any partition of this territory. Um, so, uh, the Zionists were the only ones willing to talk partition or a division of the land uh, with the UN and they got their way. It's what happened after that that is the really controversial, painful part of the story uh, that Israel's new historians uh, documented in black and white. Um, coerced expulsions followed from the middle of February 1948, uh, when Jewish soldiers or Israeli soldiers began uh, uh, emptying Palestinian villages. On the 10th of March 1948, what was pla called Plan Dalit or Plan D uh, was adopted by uh, the Haganah and that was accompanied by several massacres, uh, most notable of which was the massacre in the village of Deir Yassin, which is still talked about by Palestinians and historians today. Um, the Arab League, in turn, learning about these expulsions, took a decision to uh, intervene militarily, uh, but only after the British mandate came to an end, and which it did on the 15th of May 1948. The Jewish agency, as it was until then, immediately declared the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine, which was immediately recognized by the two superpowers of the day, the USA and USSR, and on the very same day, joint Arab forces entered Palestine. By February 1948, the American administration, interestingly, because America today is one of the biggest supporters of Israel, had concluded that the UN partition resolution, far from being a peace plan, was proving a recipe for bloodshed and hostility. It offered a number of alternative schemes like uh, international trusteeship, a three-month ceasefire, various other kinds of things. But the Zionists rejected these proposals out of hand. And as we'll see, there were good reasons uh, for their decision. Um, even as the clock timed out on the peace efforts, the killing escalated. Deir Yassin, Kubaya, many, many massacres followed. And I'm, I'm going to talk you through some of them. 
the Haganah's high plan, uh, high command, which was run by a sort of co-group uh, around Ben Gurion called the Consultancy, uh, made the first decisions to ransack villages and kill a number of their uh, inhabitants in this effort to seize as much or make what was their territory now uh, free of the Arabs. Uh, the British authorities who were still present uh, in Palestine were responsible for maintaining law and order. But just like in India, where we saw these you know, huge partition massacres, uh, they chose to stay out for the la larger part. Uh, and one of the villages the Israeli high command selected was Balad al-Sheikh, the burial place of Sheikh Izzuddin Qasam. And why is Balad al-Sheikh the burial place important? Well, uh, today... Uh, Hamas's uh, sort of sword arm, if you like, is called uh, Sheikh Izzuddin al Qassam Brigades. Uh, he was one of the very charismatic Arab leaders who participated in the 1930s uh, Arab rebellion and was killed by the British in 1935. Uh, his grave is a place of veneration if you're a Palestinian uh, nationalist or a Palestinian Islamist. Um, and even back then, I, uh, it's, it's, it's possible the Zionists were making a point. And uh, the local Israeli commander was ordered, and I quote, to encircle the village, kill the largest possible of, uh, number of men, damage uh, uh, property, but refrain from attacking women and children. Uh, it led to over 60 Palestinian civilians' death, not all of them men, um, and the British looked the other way. Two weeks later, in January 1948, a rival militia, the Palmach, uh, used this momentum to expel uh, the relatively uh, isolated Haifa neighborhood of Hawassa, that was the poorest quarter of the city, originally made up of huts and uh, lived in by impoverished villagers who came to the city seeking work in the 1920s. Um, at that time, uh, there were about 5,000 Palestinians, or believed to have been around 5,000 Palestinians, living in the eastern part of the city. Uh, the Israeli army blew up these huts and the local school, and the ensuing panic uh, led many people to flee. So, killing on the one hand, and this kind of panicked expulsion on the other. The town of Lifta, uh, which no longer exists, revolved around a small shopping uh, sort of district, uh, which included a club and two coffee houses. Uh, it attracted many Jerusalemites, which it might do if, if it was still there. Uh, one of the targets uh, of the one of the coffee houses was the target of the Haganah when it attacked on 28th December 1947. Armed with uh, machine guns, uh, members of the Haganah sprayed the coffee house, uh, while members of the rival uh, Stern Gang stopped a bus nearby and began firing into it indiscriminately. Now, of course, uh, Arab. Uh, uh, troops also uh, committed atrocities. Uh, when they hit back across the border, they ass assaulted uh, Jewish military convoys, but also settlements, um, Kefar Sold, Kefar Edzion. Um, and uh, uh, in, in, in one case, uh, 35 uh, soldiers that were uh, sent to uh, help uh, Kefar Edzion, southwest of Jerusalem, were ambushed and killed. Um, the last front was the southern Negev. That's the border with Egypt, um, where uh, the push towards Rafah is now taking place. And the Israelis reached the southern Negev in November 1948. Uh, there were Egyptian forces there, which were driven out by the Israelis. And uh, finally, the Israeli troops arrived in March 1949 uh, at a village near the Red Sea, uh, Um Rashrash, today the city of Elat. The Israeli force uh, bombed uh, the area mercilessly, uh, along with Rafah and Gaza in the last uh, month of December 1948 onwards. Uh, they also cleansed the Negev of many of the Bedouin uh, tribes that resided there. A huge tribe, the Tarabin, were expelled to Gaza. Uh, the army eventually allowed only about a thousand of its uh, members to remain. Uh, the rest were uh, you know, forcibly evicted to Gaza. Uh, and uh, others were, you know, pushed even uh, forcer. Uh, only one tribe, the Al Azazme, succeeded in returning to the neighborhood uh, after the war of 1947-1948. Uh, but they were then pushed out in the war of 1950-1954 uh, uh, by another uh, ambitious uh, special forces uh, officer uh, who led Unit 101. The officer was Ariel Sharon, who again went on to be Israel's uh, prime minister. 
In December, the Israeli units had completed the depopulation of Be'er Shaba district. Uh, and when they finished, 90% of the people who had lived there uh, for centuries uh, were gone. But what was the final fate of the Arabs? Well, as I said, they did fight back. Uh, following a brief truce in May 1948, five Arab armies uh, coordinatedly took on uh, the army of the tiny uh, 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 new Israeli nation state. And a part of Israel's uh, sort of national founding myth, if you like, is the heroic battle that Israel at its founding moment, more or less, uh, fought against these five armies and won. Uh, actually, it was uh, that, that the, this phase of the war was a, a, a little different because in Israeli minds, for a long period between May and the end of the year, um, uh, it was far from certain that Israel would be able to survive the onslaught. General Yadin, the chief of operations, was asked by members of the provisional government what the chances of standing up to the attack were. And he said, well, 50-50. And this was a sober assessment based on what he knew. Uh, even in those uh, areas where the Israel Defense Forces and uh, uh, settlers managed to repel uh, Arab assaults, it was pretty rough going. The defenders uh, had light weapons, no defense against tanks, no artillery, very rarely air support, which exacted a very heavy toll of casualties. We now know, knowing what historians now know, that actually uh, Israel enjoyed a distinct superiority in terms of both uh, men and weapons. Now knowing what we know, we know that there was no miracle. Uh, the miracle that helped, if you like, the 650,000 Jews of Palestine uh, defeat the 1.3 million Palestinians uh, and their Arab five uh, Arab allies was diplomacy and uh, their ability to skillfully mobilize the military resources they need to have a far more modern and better trained military uh, than the Arabs. Now, this was partly because Jordan, which had the most organized military uh, in the region, you know, the most capable of taking on the Israelis, uh, sort of took a pass on this conflict. Uh, in 1946, the Jewish agency had begun these uh, secret negotiations with King Abdullah of Jordan. Now, Abdullah was a, Sinite, a, Sion, a, a son of the Hashemite royal family uh, from the Hejaz, the seat of the, uh, the regions that's the seat of Mecca and Medina, um, and they fought alongside the British in the First World War. Uh, in reward for the services to uh, the crown, the British were uh, granted the Hashemites, uh, the kingdoms of Iraq and Jordan uh, that the mandate system had created. Uh, the Hashemites thought they'd also been promised Syria and uh, uh, Lebanon, um, but the British handed over these territories uh, uh, to the French. The French ousted Abdullah's brother Faisal uh, from Syria and the British compensated uh, King Faisal uh, with Iraq. Uh, as the eldest son of the dynasty, Abdullah was really unhappy with his share of all this deal. Uh, particularly all the more so because in 1924, the Hejaz, the Hashemites' homeland in what's now Saudi Arabia, uh, was wrested from them by the Saudis. Uh, Transjordan was little more than uh, arid uh, desert, uh, you know, princedom east of the river Jordan, full of Bedouin tribes and some small Circassian communities. And he wished to get, uh, you know, the fertile, cultured, sophisticated, populated Palestine. And cutting a deal with uh, the Jewish agency justified his goals, particularly since the empire had betrayed him. And uh, he went on to build this relationship. As the Second World War reached uh, ended, he reached an agreement in principle with the Jewish agency over how to divide post-mandatory Palestine between them. And uh, in return for being given the West, what's today the West Bank, uh, 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 Abdullah promised not to really join in uh, the operations of the all-Arab, pan-Arab army. Uh, the West Bank stayed in Arab hands with the Jordanians, uh, with the help of an uh, Iraqi contingent, uh, successfully re repelled repeated uh, Jewish attempts to occupy parts of that West Bank area in the second half of 1948. And this was one of the few uh, successful uh, sort of uh, Arab stories uh, in, in the military history of 1948. Um, 
Elsewhere though, as I said, the picture was one of mass expulsion, often accompanied by hideous brutality. And as I said, we know this because of the brave work of Israeli historians, which tells you something about uh, the benefits of an open democratic society. Things might not be perfect, but at least you come to know the truth. So what lessons do we draw from this? And I'll, I'll sum up. And uh, the first is, you know, the past is a great place to visit, as we often do in Explorer. It's not a great place to live in. Um, generations have grown up and passed on since 1948. And there's no going back to some imaginary time when there were no Jews uh, in Israel as some Palestinians fantasize. Uh, there's no doubt that history was very unjust to the Palestinians. Uh, I can completely understand why a Palestinian living in 1947-48 would have said there's no reason to sacrifice my ancestral lands for the crimes of uh, Europe. Um, but Jews had been subjected to terrible atrocities and centuries of atrocities in Europe as well. Um, some Israelis today imagine an Israel without Arabs might bring them security. Uh, Arabs hope to annihilate their oppressors. As I said, these are fantasies. These are not uh, realistic hopes. Um, and there's an important lesson there for us in India as well, because we're a country that also emerged from horrors. We should away, beware being seduced by fantasies about what we would like. We have to live with the realities that we have, not something that might have existed in some point in history. So the second point is, there are lots of formulas about how this conflict might end. And we're seeing a lot today with the Americans floating again this idea of a two-state formula, many others backing it, so a Palestinian state and an Israeli state. Um, in my view, uh, there's too much hatred and anger for any of these formulations uh, to be truly workable simply with a political deal. You can come up with any formula you like in a negotiation room. Uh, but will it really stick on the ground? After all, the UN had formulas back in 1947. Uh, people had formulas before then. But these formulas don't really work unless you have trust. Trust is the foundation of a political agreement. And here we have two peoples who have very little. Um, and this question needs to be addressed. Uh, finally, how do you build trust? And I think uh, that you build it by reading, learning, hearing, and accepting, emotionally accepting the truth. Um, history is very, very rarely, as we can see uh, from the story of the birth of Israel and Palestine, what we imagine it to be. Uh, the stories uh, that we tell ourselves of the heroism of our own sides, the cleanness of our own side, the barbarism of the other, are usually pretty much half the story uh, and uh, history has very few innocents. Uh, there's always a reason for what people do, a good reason or a bad reason maybe, but a reason. And truth-telling about those reasons has to be the beginning of any process of reconciliation. We've seen that force, even overwhelming force, doesn't, hasn't settled the Israel-Palestinian conflict. Uh, today, um, after three wars, after the terrible terrorist attacks on Israel and after the savage Israeli uh, counter-attacks in Gaza, nothing is has actually fundamentally changed. You still have millions of people, resentful and angry, prone to radicalization on one side and a country that's lurching rightwards on the other. Um, in a region like the Middle East, it's of course important um, for the world to nudge both sides into finding a way forward uh, because the last thing the world needs or can afford is uh, a violent confrontation that spills across the Middle East from this little hub. Uh, but there are also some lessons in this, I would suggest, uh, for places uh, like India. <laughs>